Hallelujah. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Yeah, that's what this day is special. I heard on the radio this morning our own our radio program out of St. Louis. It said that, that statistically this is the, uh, the lowest attended Sunday of the year. So if, if any of you guys who are spending your Sundays here instead of the church that you normally go to and you need an excuse, just take them a bulletin and say, I was in church last Sunday. Just count me here too, okay? <laughs> well, but on that first Easter day, we just talked about one of the disciples was missing that day. On that first Easter night when all the disciples were gathered, Thomas was missing. Not Thomas the tank engine, but Thomas the disciple was missing. Uh, the kids know that Thomas name. Yeah. And uh, uh, never mind. <laughs> okay. But Thomas was missing. And Thomas is us in the story, in, in the events. And we're so thankful that Thomas was there and that he just didn't believe. We have charitably given him the, 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 the name Doubting Thomas. He wasn't doubting, folks. He was not. He just, I don't believe it. See, because the other disciples had seen Jesus on that first Easter night, and, and, and he showed them, and they were able to touch him later in the, in the Bible where they're, they're giving their eyewitness testimonies, and they say, you know, we have touched him. We have feel him with the fingers, our fingers in the, in the wounds in his hands and, and in his side, and, and we have seen him. We've touched him. With, and, and there are lots of stories, but these are the first times that, that, the disciple, that he appeared to the disciples. And he, Thomas wasn't there the first night. And the whole week, the disciples were trying to convince Thomas that they had seen the Lord. Now, some of the women were the first to have seen him, but they were women. So in those days, they weren't legal witnesses. They, they, they didn't count. But he had... Ten disciples still hanging around. Ten men who saw Jesus, and, they, and, and some of them several times, and he didn't believe them. He says, you guys, you guys got to touch him. I won't got to believe it until I touch him. He, that's why the second Sunday night, Sunday after Easter, that would be this day, and that night Jesus comes and appears, and he says the same thing he did before, peace be with you. In Hebrew, that's a word you know, shalom. And then he looked at Thomas, because even though Thomas wasn't there, God understood what Thomas was, uh, Jesus understood, because he's God, what Thomas had been saying and thinking. And so he said, Thomas, Put your fingers here. Put your hand here. And it wasn't, it wasn't a if you like to. It was a do it. <laughs> do it. Now. And he does. See, John skips that part charitably for Thomas. But then he gives Thomas his reply. My Lord and my God. Finally... Thomas believes that Jesus, his teacher, his Lord, his Savior, his God, has risen from the dead. Now, Jesus sort of had to do that because Thomas was going to be one of his apostles, which means he was sending Thomas along with the rest of the disciples out into the whole world to tell them about what they had seen and heard Jesus do, including dying on the cross and coming to life again. That was going to be their job. And they were all pretty slow about it. They had all had to see Jesus risen from the dead. Thomas at that point was the only disciple that hadn't. So Jesus came to show him too. And he believed. The, last week we talked about how John was the first of the disciples to, to look in. And uh, 
Well, actually, he was second. But he, was, he looked in, and, and Peter was the first, and then, then John. But John believed when he saw. But John had to see something. John had to see something as he saw the grave claws inside the tomb, and there's nothing in it. And the face cloth was all folded up neat and nice and put over the corner. So he had seen that. He began to believe, but he kind of kept it to himself. And they had, to, they had to have confidence in it. They had to be able to teach people that thing with a confidence that says, we saw this, we witnessed this, we have touched him, we have eaten with him, and he is alive. Because that was going to be their job. And they did it. And now, after that first week, Thomas could be a part of that, a witness to his resurrection. Now, our problem is, is that we're more like Thomas and like the other disciples than some of them that really bought it right off, like the women. <laughs> they believed that he was alive, particularly Mary Magdalene. And she went back to tell the disciples. They didn't believe her because she was a woman. See, that, that, that uh, gender prejudice has been around a long time. And that was legal then. Women were not, a, not legal witnesses. Okay. But they had to go out into the world and, and preach. How often do we want to say, oh, I wish, you know, I, really, I have a little difficulty, you know. This, is, this was 2,000 years ago, actually only 13 years short of 2,000 years ago, that Jesus died and rose from the dead. And there's been a lot of people that saying, ah, that really didn't happen. Uh, that, that wasn't the way it went. That, that wasn't what it he would, They have a lot of, and they listen to it. And, and from our sinful nature, that part of us which is not holy, not good fruit doing part of us, but the bad fruit part doing of us, as we talk with, with the kids, they don't want to hear what God has to say. They don't want to believe what God tells us in the Scriptures about what He has done for us. And so Thomas is there to help us understand that this really did happen. It happened this way, just like it said in His Word. And that's why Jesus said to him, Thomas, you believe because you have seen these things. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. So that's what Peter in his epistle later is talking to, uh, saying the same thing. He says, we have witnessed these things and have told you these things. And blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And to show you how convinced that the disciples were, shortly after all this and shortly after Pentecost Sunday, when the Holy Spirit came to them in an even greater measure so that they, would, they wouldn't be hiding in locked rooms upstairs on Sunday night, but they would be out in the marketplace talking to people and in the temple telling them about. And that's what the first reading today was about, because the disciples had been in the temple, and the same people who put Jesus to death because they didn't like him being there telling them stuff that, that was different from what they were telling the people. And so they were trying to shut the disciples up when they were trying to tell what Jesus, what they'd seen him, and they arrested him, and then they discussed it, and, and, and this, uh, one, of the, one of the top rabbis of all times happened to be there, at the, uh, alive at that time. And he said, you know, if this is not from God, it's going to die off anyway. But if this is from God, there's no way that we're going to keep these guys quiet, and, 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 and it's going to grow. So let them alone. And so they took the disciples out and just beat the tar out of them and then let them go. And they went home to lick their wounds and cry and say, oh, what are we into? No, they didn't do that. They went straight to the temple and started right where they left off telling exactly what they, that got them in trouble in the first place. That's what's happened. That's 
what it's about, to believe. Now, that Jesus rose from the dead, it either happened or it didn't. And you can either believe it or not, and or unbelieve it or not. And that's why, if, did you see the sermon title? It's kind of different. You see, it says what? Unbelievable or not. And I spell that differently than the way it sounds. Un, un. Un is our nature. We are unwilling to listen to God. We are unable to do anything that God asks of us to do. And we are un, you know, we're just un. That's our nature. And, and be, be like bees. We will listen and believe almost anything else than what God tells us in the Bible. Little bees, and we go like from, from one flower to another. We go from, from one doctrinal uh, presentation to another church, another background, another this, another that, another this, and just flit around. And if we find something that suits us for a while, we'll, we'll take of that, and we'll keep coming back to that, and pick up more pollen, and, and go back to our, and take it home and to live with it, and so forth and so on. But it's just, you know, it's over here, and it's over here, over here. And, and then we leave, we leave the Word of God untouched, unstudied, undigested, on a part of it. We only take that part of it that feels good to us. But that's not, you know, and, and so we're, and for the rest of it we say, ah, oh, that's a bunch of bull. And we just dismiss it. The problem is that in life and time, it's like trying to get upstream in life trying to get to the source of the stream, and we got all this stuff in the way. There's life. There's rocks. There's creatures in the water. There's waterfalls. There's stuff on the... It's, and, and, and we can't get up there because we have no paddle. <laughs> we are up the creek with no paddle or an oar. It's not a name for paddle. An unbeliever is up the creek with no paddle, leaving everything else behind. But, it, it, but if you believe, even though you haven't seen it, but if you heard the Word of God, read it, marked, inwardly digested, so God works through that Word, just as He worked through the disciples. And the Holy Spirit comes to help us grasp it, to help us understand it, to help it grow within us. And that's where the knot comes in, is that God ties us to himself by the power of the Holy Spirit, makes us his children, and helps us, gives us a paddle to paddle through life, and we're not paddling. He's the paddle, and he paddles for us. The Holy Spirit enables us to do what God wants us to do. One of the phrases we've been using now is that God gave the Ten Commandments and nobody did anything about them. We can't. But God gave His Son and whoever believes finds that everything we need to do about our salvation has already been done. We can't paddle up to God with our good works and our good deeds. It means nothing to God. Only as he gives us the faith to believe, he does those things and, and helps us grow and gives us the Holy Spirit to believe, to grasp hold by God's strength, not our own, but by God's strength to hold on to the promises of God that he forgives us our sins and gives us life and salvation and gives us the Holy Spirit to paddle us up through the stream of life. And whenever in that stream... But at the end of the stream, which we're talking about time, in time, whenever it happens, whether you paddle by God's grace and power till Christ comes, but whenever, Jesus then takes us from the time, the river of time, and places us directly with him in heaven.
those who believe, even though we have not seen. But oh, by the way, as you believe, your eyes will be opened to begin to see how God is working within your life to put you at a particular place, particular time, particular way, not only to hear his word, but then to do the kinds of things that God wants you to do, to share the gospel with other people. And then you'll begin to see, like, sometimes he'll let you even see it, that you have been God's instrument in bringing other people to know about Jesus. That's part of why we have a preschool. We don't know where, where your families are from. There are many different backgrounds. Most of them are, are church members someplace, if not a few of them even here at Messiah. But our objective is to tell them about Jesus. And so that that can be a seed planting. And if it enhances the planting that, that you parents are already doing, all the better to help it grow within these children and within their families. We spend the rest of the time also on the rest of our people to feed them the Word of God because that's how it happens. We hear God's Word and He gives us His Holy Spirit who paddles us through life and all its trials, all its tribulations, all of its difficulties. And God says, why? Because I love you. And I want to give you eternal life. And through all the floods, the struggles, the things of paddling uphill, up the stream, we have a peace because we know that we're going to, not by our power, but by God's power, we're going to reach the goal. Because he's promised it's us. We're going. We're going to heaven. That's a certainty. As certainty as Christ rose from the dead, we too shall rise and spend eternity with him. And through all the troubles of time, we have a peace that human understanding just cannot grasp hold of because they can't see it. They can't touch it. They can't. But it's there for God's children. And it keeps our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until He comes in glory and takes us to be with Him.